Senator Rubio. Thank you both for being here. Um, I think this is a really important conversation. We spend a lot of time and um, talking about tactics around here, but if tactics aren't driven by a strategic aim, um, then, then, then I think it's difficult both to justify it to the American people and ultimately you just lose yourself in, in why you're doing things. And, and I, I think this is a long overdue conversation and I'm very happy that the chairman and the ranking member chose this topic because we've got some decisions to make about our strategic view that I think could be a bipartisan one and, and a strong consensus in our foreign policy making um, in this new era. I, there are a lot of challenges, but there, there are two I want to ask you about. The, the first is, you know, this rise of autocratic regimes who go through some of the rituals of democracy. You know, they have an election, but the, nobody can run against them, and, and there's no free press and things of this nature. Um, and and they also have a, elements of state control capitalism, and so they're the rise of these, and they're sort of out there arguing to people, look how stable we are, we're prosperous, and we have stability, and then they point to the West and the upheaval we're facing across the developed nations of the West. Uh, some of it is a function of technology and globalization that have impacted the working class and the middle class and leading to real upheaval that's manifested politically. The other interrelated is we have our first near-peer competitor in China since the end of the Cold War. I mean, yeah, Russia is a uh, strategic competitor in key parts of the world, largely as a spoiler and in increasingly as a aggravator, but, but not like China. In fact, I would argue they pose a comprehensive challenge, unlike even the, so even the Soviet Union was never an industrial or technological challenger in that realm. And, and the Chinese are spreading their model of authoritarian capitalism, and they're, sh they're trying to shape these post-World post War II institutions <coughs> in a way that's sort of beneficial to them. You know, and, then, and then you also see them in these efforts to dominate the Asia-Pacific region, most certainly be a dominant power there. They view that as their right historically, and, and then, of course, challenge the U.S. across multiple domains across the world. And so I think there's two big strategic decisions we need to make. The first is, uh, are we going to defend liberal democracy, and in particular, the value of individual human rights? Uh, because if we're not pushing back on that, both in words and in action, it's not just a nice thing to do, right? There's a strategic value to doing that if there's no counterbalance to this authoritarian movement. And then the other is China, where we're kind of been told there's only two choices, at least in the broader scheme. One is that we either try to modify their rise or we try to stop their rise. And, and I think the question is whether there is a, a third option there, and that is some level of strategic equilibrium. In essence, we don't want there to be an imbalance in the relationship because it could very well lead to conflict. And, and that's why we have to be careful about things like Made in China 2025, right? They want to dominate these 10 key industries around from aerospace to agriculture machinery and the technologies and the like. And just back on the first point, it, it, on the uh, pushing back on, on this autocratic rise, it also explains why we should care about the internment of Uyghur Muslims in, in China, why we should support those like in Venezuela that are, that are demanding democracy through their constitutional order is why we should care about the murder of Khashoggi. Uh, you don't chop people up in consulates. Um, and because if we don't push back, we're completely surrendered that. So on just on those two points, I mean, it, first of all, I think you would agree that it's important for there to be sort of a strategic consensus in order to drive our tactics and our policies. And particularly on the China point, uh, is the right way to frame it or is the right view that this is not about constraining or const they're going to be a great power. It is about ensuring that there is a strategic balance between the countries because the absence of that balance could lead to conflict. I think you've got it just right. You know, after the end of the Cold War, we thought the ideological struggle was over and we had won. And I agree with you, in the emergence of China, we see a competitor like we've never known before in terms of its, its scale across the board, diplomatic, economic, militarily. Um, they do have a, a, a different model than we do. They are competing actively, advocating that model in the international system, and we're hardly in the game. Uh, we need to start reaffirming our confidence in our model and s fix our problems at home so the brand looks good internationally because it's working effectively at home, uh, and then compete uh, in the ideological struggle with China. I think in the end of the day, if we do that, we will win. Uh, but I think at this point, we're not in the game. I agree with you on China. That's why I tried to say, can we be strategic competitors and strategic cooperators at the same time? And that means some areas we are gonna have to be, uh, 
for example, like the digital infrastructure where I think we are going to have to not make sure that China does not monopolize or dominate that area. Uh, there are other areas where I think they're less strategic to us where we can cooperate. We're going to have to try and find some balance. Just um, two quick comments, Senator, if I could add. First on China, I absolutely agree with you. This is not an issue, in my view, so much of constraining China because its rise is going to continue. The question is, into what world does it rise? And we have the capacity through you know, the rejuvenation of ourselves, our political and economic system at home, and then working with friends and allies across the Indo-Pacific and around the world and adapting institutions to help shape that world into which China's rise occurs and to help shape its own incentives and disincentives for its actions in that world. And finally, on human rights, I couldn't agree with you more. This is not just a moral issue, as important as that is for the United States. It's a practical source of our influence in the world, especially if we're consistent about this and we're willing to call to account not just adversaries, which is easier to do, but also friends of ours. Because it's not, it's not as if you know, they're doing a favor to us by listening to those kind of concerns. State after state around the world, it's particularly true in the Middle East, and we saw this in the Arab Spring, that don't pay attention to those basic indignities or human rights become brittle and break and they don't become reliable partners over time. So I couldn't agree with you more. It's very important for us to factor that in for practical reasons to the way in which we deal with other societies.